Thank you for listening to this PYA webinar recast. PYA is pleased to offer this alternative way to access our thought leadership. This is a recording of a previously delivered webinar. The information is accurate as of the date of the original event. The video recording, slides, and associated material for this and all PYA webinars are available on our website at pyapc.com. This podcast is for educational purposes only. It is not intended to be used as legal advice or an official opinion. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the first episode of the Let's Get Rural webinar series. Today's topic is managing regulatory and reimbursement challenges. PYA is happy to present today's webinar on this important topic. With that, I would like to introduce our presenters, Marty Ross and Kathy Reap. Thank you, Trevor, and good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am Marty Ross in PYA's Kansas City office. I'm joined by Kathy Reap um, from Orlando, Florida. Where is, is it raining yet, Kathy? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. Um, you, Kathy and I may be a familiar faces to some. Um, we generally host PYA's Healthcare Regulatory Roundup webinar series and have for about the last three years. And PYA sponsors a pretty broad range of webinar series uh, for healthcare providers, um, which are all recorded and accessible on our webpage that you see here. Um, you can even listen on Spotify as you drive around town. Um, but as we were discussing about it, how we make sure we're covering the wide range of issues um, as part of these webinar series, Kathy and I appreciated that we need to take a chance twice a year and just do a deep dive into rural issues. So beginning with this inaugural webinar, uh, we're starting our Let's Get Rural webinar series. Uh, it's sponsored by PYA Center for Rural Health Advancement, uh, which is our vehicle for bringing together the broad range of services that PYA offers and looking at that through a rural lens. So our agenda for our first Let's Get Rural webinar is, of course, a top 10 because we can't resist having lists. Um, and then towards the end, assuming we have time, we'll discuss some of the goings on in Washington, D.C. Um, and how that will potentially impact rural providers. Very important here is since we are just starting, we really would appreciate your feedback. So as we're going through this list, as the depth of how we go into topics, the breadth of the topics, the type of topics, uh, we'd really appreciate your feedback. Uh, we will certainly be back in November or December. We don't have a set date yet with another version of Let's Get Rural, um, but we really want to grow this into something that is useful uh, for rural providers and other stakeholders. So we're going to start with two topics that are sort of high on your to-do list right now, um, and the rest of our topics are some informational, some to highlight activities you'll need to be engaging in in the short term, and some of are just really policy discussions, um, really to give you the opportunity to share pain um, that rural providers face. So Kathy, I'm gonna turn this over to you to talk about your favorite topic, price transparency. Yep, favorite topic. I guess the issue is, Marty, I don't know how much longer we'll be talking about price transparency, at least from this perspective, with the compliance requirements for July of this year. So got to do a little bit of a refresher as we talk about this issue. And just I'm sure you're all aware, but again, we've got to do this. We have original requirements for posting um, machine readable files shoppable for services, um, both of which were effective in January of 2021. Uh, the requirements for those files was actually through an executive order under the Trump administration. There has been legislation addressed last year, although it was not um, um, ultimately passed, but probably will come back again this year to actually codify that executive order and these requirements, but we are right now working off of executive order and regulations. So the original order um, and regulations that we um, were in compliance with, were that you post for all of the items and services that you provide, all those items within your charge master, you post what are called five standard charges, um, your gross charge, your payer-specific negotiated 
charge, that is the term that CMS used as opposed to rate, um, but the gross charge, your negotiated rates, both by payer and plan, um, looking back over all of those negotiated rates, what was the highest, what was the lowest, you were to identify those. Um, and then if you had a discounted cash price, to also post the discounted cash price. You did also have the requirement for shoppable services um, that could be met by using a uh, internet-based price estimator tool. Price as the shoppable services was 70, uh, represented 70 services identified by CMS, and then up to up to 300 total services as long as you provided 300 distinct shoppable services. These are things that a person would be looking for and pricing out. Uh, it's not going to be a level five e &M visit. It's going to be something along the lines of a chest x-ray or CT scan, something that someone could be shopping for best price. Um, that internet um, based um, price estimator tool um, could replace the shoppable services and that actually was a way for the individual to put in identifying information and to query their own insurance for if I go to XYZ provider and have a chest x-ray, how much will I owe? That actually seems use, useful to the beneficiary or to the, to the individual, um, but that was an alternative uh, for shoppable services. Both files needed to be updated annually and just remember what we're going to talk about now the new changes only apply to the machine readable file. We are not looking at any changes right now to shoppable services or the internet based uh, price estimator. So next so, slide, Marty. Oh, go ahead. Well, before the slide, this is what you get when you let me control the slides, Kathy. Um, just to confirm, these requirements apply both to PPS hospitals and critical access hospitals. Absolutely. Correct? Absolutely. And I know you and I have discussed previously that if you have a hospital-owned physician practice, that your files would include it, those rates as well. If you employ your physician is it, in physicians, it's also going to include um, their charges, their services, their charges, their negotiated rates. Um, and as we get into the new requirements for 2024 and 2025, going to find out that there are some issues that CMS was not really thinking, can I use that word, um, about all of the services hospitals provide. Um, and I will give you an example of that in a minute. When I say that you're posting it for your entire hospital, that's going to be your distinct part units and any other entities that are a part of that hospital. So let's kind of, we'll walk through it and show you where they made a mistake. And so that, okay, that just to, to just to finish this off, it's going to include a provider-based rural health clinic as well. Absolutely. Okay. Provider-based. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. So we had some requirements um, that came out in the outpatient final rule that was uh, published in November of last year um, with a series of requirements for streamlining and um, streamlining the um, machine readable file and limiting the types of formats and the display of that information to make it more user friendly. Um, the main thing that we had to do as of January 1 of 2024 was to quote unquote, make a good faith effort to the, ensure that the information that is avail that is provided is complete and accurate. We're gonna talk about a testing to that accuracy in a few minutes because that's gonna be a July 1 requirement. But January 1 of this year, good faith effort. Um, you were required to have on your website, on, um, at least on your homepage, could be elsewhere as well, but at least on your homepage, um, in the footer, the words price transparency. If you click on price transparency, you're going to be able to go directly to um, the public website that, that has your machine readable file. And then last but not least, you needed to create a TXT file. Um, there is a um, TXT file generator available on the CMS website. And essentially what you were doing on this um, particular uh, file is that you are identifying where your machine readable file is housed 
the actual website of that. And you are also going to be identifying who is the individual who is responsible for uh, if there are any questions, who's the contact for the machine readable file, as well as their email. Um, I've given you the, um, um, the format for the um, TXT file. If you, after this webinar, were to plug in um, www. and then this is going to be your hospital domain name, whether it be abc.com or abc.net or whatever it might be, your hospital um, domain name, slash cms-hpt.txt, you should be able to come up with that information, essentially name of your hospital, location of your hospital, um, where your files are maintained, who is your contact, and what is that contact's um, information. That was January 1. Now, this is where we get really concerned because July 1 is a couple of weeks away, um, coming up very quickly. And there was a lot more information that had to be addressed um, during uh, for this change. Many of the files that have currently been posted by providers are essentially um, Excel spreadsheets um, that are um, provide information, all your items and services that you provide, and then your rates going across. It was very hard for someone to look at that information, and when you have a number, for example, in a negotiated rate, know if that was a percentage, if it was the actual rate, if it was, what did it actually represent? Were you paid on a per diem for a DRG or were you paid a flat rate? It was very hard to truly identify what was meant by a lot of the information on the files. So moving with January, uh, July 1, we're going to be encoding all of the data elements on the machine readable file. It's going to be limited to the formats that we can use, um, either a comma separated value format wide or comma separated value format tall. And then uh, the other, other option is the JSON schema that you could be using. CMS has posted um, for these various formats with samples, examples, and actually a template for you to use posting your information into any of these files. For each of your standard charges, a lot more information that you're going to have to be posting um, moving forward. For each of the items and services that you provide, you're going to have to identify the location or setting. Is this inpatient, outpatient, both? Is it something that is provided at facility A but not facility B, that kind of thing? You're going to have to provide that level of detail. For all of your um, items and services, you're going to have to identify a variety of codes. Um, you're going to have to identify CPT codes, HICS, PICS codes, national drug codes, DRGs, APCs, um, um, revenue code center um, codes, and you're going to be literally putting um, on the file RCC and then the revenue code that would be applicable to that particular line item um, service. What CMS has now identified based upon questions that have providers have asked, is they forgot about um, inpatient rehab as an example because they do not have the ability for you to use a um, code that says that this is a um, CM, CMG, a case mix group code for inpatient rehab. So they have in their instructions developed some um, alternatives for how you could do that. But I know that some of the rural hospitals, the critical access hospitals have um, distinct part um, rehab and site services recognize that those are also going to have their files posted. For each of the payers, and um, you have to identify payer and plan um, as separate data elements. You can group multiple PPOs if you have the same payer and the same contracted rate. Um, and finally, you're going to have to identify now I have a charge of $100. For this particular payer, I have negotiated a rate of, let's say, $80. Now, is that a percentage? Is that a, um, a flat rate? Um, is it based upon a per diem? Whatever it might be, you're going to have to identify the methodology that is used um, to establish that rate and then also post the rate. 
So for an item that is paid on a percentage, you're going to say it's the charge is $100. It is paid on a percentage. The percent is 80%. The rate is $80. So a lot more information that you are going and posting. Um, finally, um, you are ultimately, and this will actually be a requirement in an, um, coming up, but you're going to have to go through, and if it is based upon some type of a formula, you're going to have to show the historical value, but that won't be until um, January of next year. So the next slide, Marty, on data validation. This is very important that um, whoever is posting your file takes your file as it is ready to be posted and runs it against CMS's online validator. Um, take, compare your file to the template layout data specs that have been posted by CMS to find out whether or not you are compliant with the required postings for July 1. Now you will get an error if it is non-compliant. You could get a warning and that warning means uh, you haven't done something, but it's not going to stop your file from being accurately, appropriately uh, accepted. It's going to be something like you haven't posted the uh, something that is required in January of 2025. So you could get a warning. You still got work to do. An error means they aren't going to accept your file. And the next slide. Um, the the other issue that we're looking at is for the new for the new files um, as of July one, you have to attest or certify to the completeness and accuracy of your machine readable file. Um, this compliance statement, um, to the best of its knowledge and belief, this hospital has included all applicable standard charge information in accordance with the requirements of 45 CFR 180.5. The information encoded in this machine readable file is true, accurate, and complete as of the date indicated in this file. You are going to say true because it's not going to accept your file if you say false. But Marty, what happens if I say true and it's not true? Bad things. How's that? Um, because it's gonna, I think this is a really interesting question uh, around enforcement activity because we've seen relative, we have seen enforcement activity out of CMS. It is all publicly reported. Um, we've had hospitals that have been subject to civil, money penalty, civil monetary penalties, and there have been appeals of those. But I think that's the question here is now that CMS said this is what it has to look like and there's no ambiguity, do you think this is an invitation uh, for more aggressive enforcement action by CMS around transparency? Could it be a false claim? It, that, that's interesting. Um, you know, what, how are you, is this part of your condition of submitting any claim to Medicare that you appropriately posted your price transparency files? Because it is, you know, that's the condition. It's tied to your Medicare participation. So potentially, there's a, there's a potential theory there. Um, but and also the other question I had for you, Kathy, is does this compliance statement require you to update files as your rates change? No, you have to update at least annually. So this is as of the date indicated in this file. The one thing that I urge you to do as you're looking at this is a lot of providers, uh, appropriately so, use outside vendors to post this information. Who's hitting that true button? Who's saying true? Is this being done by those vendors without any review or um, um, uh, I guess I re review is the right word by the um, provider themselves. Uh, from the provider perspective, I personally think that you need to have this looked at. CFO, managed care contracting, um, rev cycle, um, compliance, and I'm even going to bring in because so much of the pharmacy charge master is zero because you update your rates very frequently based upon the cost of the drugs and on. Um, you need to make sure that whatever your charge is for that particular drug on the day you post your file is what is in here. Um, make sure pharmacy is looking at this as well. Um, make sure that your information is true and accurate. At least do your best. If you suddenly find yourself with a lot of charges that seem outrageous, this is your charge, um, go in and make sure that there hasn't been an input error. Uh, I go back to that $44,000 plus 12 lead EKG that we noticed on one provider. 
It's not true. It's an error. It's a typo. Um, so look for those kinds of things and don't just hit true um, without doing some review and audit. Finally, there are some requirements on the next slide related to Ju uh, January of 2025. Um, one is if you have a negotiated rate that is based on some sort of a formula, an algorithm, you're going to have to go back in and establish an estimated allowed amount. That estimated allowed, allowed amount is your average reimbursement previously received from that payer for that particular service. Um, CMS is not saying you must do it this way, but they are strongly recommending, first of all, that you do that calculation of historical reimbursement by using your 835 remit. And secondly, that you look at the, um, you look at at least a year's worth of data go back 12 months to get that um, historical um, reimbursement. They're not requiring you to do that, but they strongly recommend. You are also going to have to, for all of your uh, the, the drugs that are included in your charge master, identify both the drug unit and the type of measurement. And finally, if there is a modifier that impacts your standard charge, um, then you're going to have to include modifiers in your file too. There is a lot of information on the CMS website um, related to um, main, um, becoming compliant with the new rules. There is also a, I don't know how to do it, can you help me with? And I have been monitoring that file, the, the postings. CMS responds almost every day to the questions that are posed. They might refer you back to an answer they gave someone else. Otherwise, they might ask you specifically, answer you specifically, or ask for more information. But they are being very responsive on this. Um, again, as this deadline is approaching so rapidly, if you do have specific questions that you're uh, wrestling with on your price transparency files, please just drop a question um, in this panel pane. What we do then is email back to you um, as we're after the webinar. Particularly links and things like that. So yes. polling question. Our first polling question is, will your hospital be ready by July 1? Yes, no, unsure, or my organization is not a hospital. Remember, you must fill out the polling questions in order to receive CPE credit. Thank you for participating in our poll. Now I'll hand it back over to our presenters. Excellent. It's great to see that we have a lot of folks that are ready for that regulatory requirement. So let's talk about another one. Well, and for those who said unsure, go check. Exactly. Okay. Oops, sorry. Think back to the slides. Oh, so let's talk about Section 1557 non-discrimination rules. Um, this was the final rule that was published by the Office of Civil Rights in May of this year um, that relates to Section 150. 1557, excuse me, of the Affordable Care Act. It's been 14 years since the Affordable Care Act passed. It's just how time flies when you're having fun. Uh, but this provision of the ACA prohibits discrimination uh, based on protected class uh, for individuals, uh, for, excuse me, for health programs and activities that receive federal financial assistance. The original implementing regulations for uh, 1557 were published in 2016. Um, that set of rules were superseded by another set of final rules published in 2020, and now the 2024 rule supersedes the 2020 rule, and you can sort of follow the administrations um, through this process. Uh, this was a rule that had initially been proposed in July of 22. Um, OCR received over 85,000 comments from providers and other organizations, uh, but it has now published a rule that will become effective on July Fifth. One important clarification made in the final rule, uh, the, the April of 2024 final rule, is exactly to whom these requirements apply, um, includes any Medicare or Medicaid participating providers, as well as MA plans, Part D plans, state Medicaid agencies, MCOs, and other qualified health plans. That is not an exclusive list, uh, but it is certainly now broadly applicable um, throughout the industry. Substantive provisions within the final rule 
include the definition of discrimination based on sex in the context of 1557. Um, it includes sex assigned at birth, gender identity, recorded gender, and pregnancy or pregnancy-related conditions. And so discrimination based on one of these factors uh, is now prohibited under Section 1557. Um, the new rule also states that providers may rely on applicable federal protections, excuse me, for religious freedom and conscience um, in specific context procedures or healthcare services. What this provision of the final rule is replacing what had been in the 2020 rule, which was a blanket abortion and religious freedom exception for healthcare providers, now in favor of a process to obtain assurances of such protection. So we replace the blanket protection um, with instead this more case-by-case -case evaluation of how that um, process, how those protections will be exercised. What we're going to be concerned about in terms of 1557 are the sub are the procedural requirements that it is imposing on healthcare providers, and these are sort of a rolling set of requirements over the next year, um, beginning with the requirements applicable on November 2 of this year. Um, requiring a covered organization to designate a Section 1557 coordinator if that entity has 15 or more employees. This person is responsible for serving as point on uh, discrimination-related discrimination issues uh, within the organization, so effectively a, a, a substantive compliance officer around these particular issues. One more hat. One more hat, exactly, one especially hat. in rural areas, exactly, one more hat. Um, you are also required by November 2 to have posted a notice of non-discrimination on your website as well as your physical locations and then provide that notice to individuals upon request. So there you've got the EMTALA notice, you've got the HIPAA notices, you've got your No Surprises Act notices. Now you can add to that your Section 1557 notices. Uh, the good news is on the OCR's website, which you see linked at the bottom of the slide, there are sample language for those notices on which you can rely. Then in about a year... Of those, of, those, um, yes. of, of the information as well? Yes. The good news is that those postings include um, the notice translated into several languages. So that is available and accessible. So you do not have to go to the expense and the hassle of having those translated. They're already available in the translate, translations on the OCR website. And again, that's a November 2 requirement. By May 1st of next year, you will have needed to have implemented and provided employee training on specified 1557 related policies and procedures. Um, the rule's actually sort of confusing on this point because at one point it says the policies and procedures must be developed by a later date, but the education requirement very clearly sets on May 1st of next year. And thus, because you're educating them on the policies and procedures, it certainly makes sense to have those finalized and approved uh, prior to that education having to been completed. And here again is that role of that coordinator is going to step in um, as they're deemed to be responsible for ensuring that the policies and procedures have been approved as well as the completion of the required training. Also by May 1st of next year, uh, this is sort of the new wrinkle also in 1557, is the requirement to evaluate the use of decision support tools, and that includes any form of um, artificial intelligence, but to evaluate those to identify and mitigate any sort of discrimination that may occur from the use of that tool based on race, color, national origin, sex, age, or disability, those protected classes. Because uh, the concern here, as we're starting to integrate AI into our workflows, that oftentimes they could have an unintended discriminatory impact as it's searching for data elements to provide a return response that what it's pulling from potentially could be um, resulting in discrimination uh, based on one of the protected classes. And so our directive is to begin uh, implementing processes to to identify and then address any sort of that discrimination. So that could be very important with a payer who is doing a prior authorization or a denial of service or something like that using any type of AI. Exactly. 
got to be cons okay thank you right right and again this isn't just providers this is providers and payers and state medicaid agencies that are now subject to these rules then by july 5th of next year um, you're going to get provide another notice uh, this is the notice of availability of services uh, this is uh, particularly focused around individuals that are LEP, like limited English proficiency, as well as um, individuals with disabilities, so uh, people that are hard of hearing or other uh, communication impediments uh, that you are communicating to them appropriately, um, that there are available language assistance and auxiliary aids. One issue that has come up is individuals who are blind. Um, what is the manner in which you divide, you provide that notice? Is it in Braille? Is it a recording? Uh, but these are the types of issues we have now just at a year uh, to figure out how we're going to address that. Um, it is appreciated that when you start thinking about how oh, we have to provide the notice, which means we have to, of course, adhere to the notice in our practices, what other modifications are we going to have to make to forms and policies and procedures within the organization. I mean, for most of us, if I ask you to show me your notice of privacy practices, you're going to show me one piece of paper um, or one file. But now beginning appreciating how do we need to be able to communicate that information to folks that have some sort of communication disability. So that are the, those, those are the 1557 requirements. Let's talk about another final rule that got not very much attention when it was published this fall, but it's going to impact uh, rural health care providers through their participation in the 340B program. Uh, this is a rule published by HRSA uh, to create an administrative dispute resolution process within 340B. This overhaul of the alternative dispute resolution process is in response to a lot of criticism around a trial-like process that had been put in place in 2020. Um, and it followed the federal rules of civil procedure and the federal rules of evidence. And it obviously was tilted um, in the favor of the pharmaceutical companies, especially against smaller providers that would be participating in the rule three, in the 340B program. And so this is now a new process that will be an effective on June 14 and June 18 in five days um, that will provide a vehicle to resolve these disputes between covered entities and manufacturers. Specifically for covered entities, we're going to look at their claims that manufacturers have overcharged them for a covered drug or in some manner limited their ability to purchase drugs at the at or below the 340B ceiling price. On the manufacturer side, it's a vehicle now to address concerns that covered entities have somehow violated the prohibition on duplicate discounts or reseller transfer of drugs to a non-patient. You know, that big issue of who is a patient for purposes of 340B. It doesn't revisit that issue. It just says, here's one vehicle for resolving those disputes between covered entities and manufacturers. Um, CURSA Office of Pharmacy Affairs that operates the 340B program has promised additional guidance prior to June 18th uh, with regard to just how this process is going to work. I checked right before today's webinar. It's still not there. Um, they have five days in case they're wondering, uh, but certainly if you, um, are facing these types of issues, be watching that website closely to see how those procedures would be um, developed by um, the Office of Pharmacy Affairs. The final rule also details um, how ADR panels will be convened, as well as their decision process and then the reconsideration process. So much more user-friendly uh, than the process we have today. Next up on our, oh, no polling question. Sorry, over to you, Trevor. Our next polling question is, does your organization participate in the 340B program? Yes, no, unsure, or my organization is not a healthcare provider. Remember, you must fill out the polling questions in order to receive CPE credit. Thank you for participating in our poll. Now I'll hand it back over to our presenters. Thanks, Trevor. Excellent. Many folks that are part of the 340B program, so hopefully you'll find this new ADR process useful. I wonder if in that no response, we have any rural emergency hospitals that um, are unable to participate in 340B uh, following conversion. We'll come back to that when we get to the subject of uh, rural emergency hospital program. So next up on our top 10 list are the critical access hospital conditions of participation. Um, familiar with the COPS, those are the rules created by CMS that 
when you in your participation agreement with Medicare, it says, and you'll follow the rules. Uh, this is the rules you are following, that if you want to be maintain your status as a Medicare participating provider, um, based on your provider type, you have to be able to demonstrate ongoing compliance with the conditions of participation. In the case of critical access hospitals, uh, we had some changes to those conditions of participation uh, shortly before the pandemic uh, that, came, that, that rolled on into effect. Um, those were changes that included the addition of a very specific infection prevention and control and antibiotic stewardship COP, as well as a quality assessment and performance improvement COP, or the QAPI COP, one of my very favorite new acronyms in healthcare. Um, and those, again, became effective in March 1st of 2020 and then March of 2021. So again, given the timing of the effective date of these, very little actual survey enforcement activity around these COPs yet. And frustrating as it is, I still cannot report uh, the publication of interpretive guidelines for the COPs, um, these particular COPs. And so these COPs are, while consistent to some degree with the hospital COPs in around infection control and QAPI, there are some substantive differences in the obligations imposed on critical access hospitals. And so we really need those interpretive guidelines to understand how those differences work in the real world. But we continue to wait. The best guidance we can offer you at this point, again, is to look at the interpretive guidelines that were published in March of last year by CMS around the comparable hospital COPs but appreciating that there are these substantive differences between the two, um, but at least it's something. That's the best I can offer you right now. Um, the other change made to the CAW COPS was in 2023, which is really a refinement around the distant requirement uh, condition for critical access hospital. Um, as you know, we no longer have necessary provider CAWs. If you were a necessary provider, Prior to the drop dead date, you will maintain that necessary provider status, but otherwise you have to qualify under the program by distance to another facility. It's either the 35 mile to the nearest facility or 25 mile drive in areas that only have secondary roads. And what was critical was CMS finally providing definitive guidance around what is a 15 mile drive on secondary roads. And they finally gave us this definition of what's a primary road versus what's a secondary road. And we are seeing that some hospitals that had had to maintain their PPS status because the, this question around how do you define 15 miles, how do you define secondary roads, um, that that issue has now been resolved. And we have actually seen some new organizations that have joined the ranks of critical access hospitals as a result of this change. Oh, how I would love to tell you that the door will reopen on necessary provider designation. And certainly we know a lot of our struggling rural PPS hospitals that this would be the solution they're looking for uh, to move to a cost, re cost reimbursed model. Uh, there is legislation that has been introduced, a couple of different pieces of legislation uh, that talk about critical access hospital qualifications and kind of a variation on reopening necessary provider status for a certain period of time or reducing or actually expanding the mileage requirement and the like. So certainly something worth keeping uh, keeping your eye on. Uh, sometimes it's really hard to keep your eye on these issues given how Congress now tends to sweep everything into major pieces of legislation. Uh, sort of what was on the table the day they came in and said, we're writing a bill. Um, you hope that your piece is on there. Um, so certainly a point of advocacy if you and your community find yourself in this position with critical access hospital. Not only when they're writing the bill, but when they actually go to vote on it, you hope it's still there. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, and that's exactly what happened with uh, the price transparency provisions, right. Kathy. It was sort of like the last minute. It was the last page they ripped from the bill yeah. um, with those provisions. Uh, the other cop to pay attention to is respiratory illness reporting requirements. Kind of to everyone's surprise, uh, those requirements that were put in place during the pandemic with regard to COVID-19 and other acute respiratory illnesses, those reporting requirements that you've had actually sunsetted on April 20th of this year. Um, and CMS had, did not have a replacement uh, ready to go 
uh, by that date. So in the FY 2025 um, IPPS proposed rule, they have now uh, promulgated new reporting requirements that are now included within both the hospital and the critical access hospital infection prevention and um, antibiotic stewardship COP. Uh, this is would be effective if finalized, and it's going to be finalized. Uh, would be effective uh, October 1st of, of this year, and that's we just have to watch fiscal year rules go into effect at, on October 1st of the preceding year. Um, the this COP covers now respiratory illness that's defined as influenza, COVID-19, as well as RSV. Um, they provide the standardized format as well as the frequency requirements. The initial frequency requirement will be a week, as CMS has stated, and then the data elements to be included in the reporting. It is certainly reporting light as compared to what you're reporting during the pandemic. It's really the number of confirmed infections, your total bed, census and capacity, as well as some limited demographic information. And not surprisingly, in this proposed rule, CNS has reserved itself the authority to certainly up the game on reporting requirements during any type of public health emergency. And that will be addressed in the final inpatient rule that comes yes. out probably in August? Probably in August. So we will know what that requirement will look like. I mean, it's going to be finalized. Uh, they they certainly. Yeah, they, they were very clear on this is what we're going to do. And in fact, encourage early reporting. Um, so if you're really missing um, reporting on those since April 20th, you can go ahead and restart and CMS will take the reports. Um, let's finally talk about the request for information on OB services COP. If you are a nerd like Kathy and me that reads through the COPs, um, you noticed that there is no discussion about obstetrics. Um, and as you are probably very well aware, we have a maternal health crisis in the United States, in part because of maternity deserts, in part because of um, quality concerns, in part because of payer policy. Whatever, I don't know whose finger you want to point, who, at whom you want to point the finger, but we have a crisis. And so CMS has said that it is clearly time to incorporate into the hospital conditions of participation some expectations about OB services. And so they have included in this year's proposed IPPS rule an, a request for information on what should be the baseline requirements for OB services to address these issues of uh, mortality and morbidity and importantly access to maternal services. Key questions they ask, because when they publish an RFI, they say, here are some questions we'd like your opinion on. So this is their solicitation of input before they formulate an actual proposal. And they start with what kinds of facilities should the COP apply to? Should it apply to all hospitals? Um, should it apply to hospitals that do or don't have OB units? Um, should it apply to hospitals that only have emergency services or all hospitals? Um, should it apply to critical access hospitals? Interestingly, should it apply to rural emergency hospitals that don't have inpatient services but do provide emergency services? Should there be certain outpatient settings um, that we have expectations uh, with regard to OB services? Um, and then they kind of say, what should the COP look like? And they kind of created a, a, a test case and said, well, we have, for example, COPs around surgical services. And we say, if you provide surgical services, um, then you need to make sure that you're delivering those in a well-organized manner and that you are ensuring compliance with nationally recognized standards of care and evidence-based practice, which is sort of, you know, it's a COP that says do it right. Um, should there be a similar type of COP for OB services or should it go into greater detail with regard to the expectations on the hospitals? So this, the, obviously the comment period on the proposed IPPS rule has passed. June we 10th. will not... Yeah, of course, Kathy knows that. Um, but we will probably not see anything substantive in the final rule. But be ready when we get the FY 2026 IPS proposed rule. I'm betting dollars to donuts that we're going to see some COP provision around OB services. I wonder if in this final rule, they're going to say we received a number of comments on, here's an overview of what they said. We'll get back to you later. But I mean, at least we will be able to see what others had to say about that particular issue. And we'll certainly get CMS's spin on the responses to the RFI as well. Yes. Okay, 
Um, while we're on the topic of critical access hospitals, let's talk about cost reporting. And since I really can't add very well, I'm going to turn this over to Kathy. The CA cost reporting is almost as bad as CA quapi, but um, I guess there are a couple things that I wanted to touch on, but then I also wanted to put a plug in for, um, I believe this will be the third year of the summer CPE symposium that PYA has offered and that there will be a session um, next Thursday, June 20th on Medicare reimbursement and effective cost reporting. Emily Wetzel will be providing that. Um, and so just recognize more deep dive on cost reporting issues um, on at that particular uh, we webinar next week. But I wanted to touch on four quick issues. First of all, as you are from a critical access hospital perspective, as you are looking at your cost report, some things you just kind of need to be able to remember to do, or you need to remember to do. Um, recognize, first of all, that your Medicare Advantage enrollees and the days associated with those patients are not counted in your Medicare days. Um, critical access hospitals are going to be reimbursed on cost um, for those um, Medicare fee-for-service patients, but your Medicare Advantage patients, they're are going to be reimbursed based on whatever you have negotiated. It might be 101% of costs, but it is going to be based upon a negotiated rate. So for the purposes of your cost report, they are not Medicare patients per se. Um, the issue of expense groupings, I think this comes about particularly as we start adding new services, new um, care, uh, uh, care, care departments, new ancillary departments, um, new even administrative departments within our organization um, is to make sure that we have our expense groupings ap appropriate. You're going to do a crosswalk between your various departments, how you've named them, what they do to those um, cost centers or quote unquote lines that are included in the Medicare cost report. So you need to have some um, really look at where things, where services are being provided and where they fall. You also need to look at staff because if staff is doing a cross um, department service, you need to appropriate allocate that staff, their time to those appropriate groupings. So very important that you do that. I, I think the review of your statistics um, is one that I have always thought was one of the most important issues that you have to do. And I'm looking at it now from the perspective of hospitals, including critical access hospitals, made a number of changes to their facilities um, during the public health emergency. There was additional funding for in terms of what you might do. You put up walls you move things around, don't rely on those allocation statistics that you used in the past to assume that they're still the same. Um, you're going to be looking at time studies. You're going to be looking at your square footage allocations, your patient days, et cetera, when you're doing that cost, that allocation. Make sure that they're current and you're not relying on something that is several years old. You also really need to be looking at um, this particular department is no longer where it was. And therefore, let's say it was at the end of the hallway from lab. Lab serves a lot of Medicare patients. So that department was carving out space from lab. Now that office has gone to lab. You don't want that square footage going to, let's say, case management when it really ought to be a part of lab where you're, you're going to be capturing your Medicare costs. So make sure that you review that. Don't just roll forward from one year to the next. Um, and then the other issue is your PSNR, your Provider Statistical Review Report, which is essentially all of the claims information um, that you have um, submitted to Medicare. At least, even if you do run it early, if you run it in advance, make sure you run it again about a month out from filing your cost report to make sure you have captured all of the claims that you can and all of the payments that you can capture, all the patient days, et cetera. Make sure you've captured all of that information. You might run it early in order to do a preliminary, but always make sure you update it with the most recent PSNR that you can get. So Marty, REH. 
So let's talk rural emergency hospital program uh, created by the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2020. One of those, you know, well, everything on the table, throw it into the legislation. Uh, this created a new category of provider in the Medicare program. So we have hospitals, critical access hospitals, and now rural emergency hospitals. Um, the hallmark of these REHs is they do not provide inpatient services. Um, um, they do not receive cost-based reimbursement. Instead, they receive an annual appropriation of about, that's, it's paid monthly, but it's a total uh, appropriation of about $3.4 million. And additionally, they receive 105% of the OPPS rate for the services they provide. Um, so where are we with the REH program? Is it the savior of rural health as promised? Um, there was predicted modeling that was done, I think by the Shep Center, uh, back in 2021, saying how many hospitals would we expect to see convert over to REH based on circumstances. And they identified 68 that they thought were potential converters. Um, at the time that analysis was done, I think we had more confidence than we have today about the continuation of the low volume hospital and Medicare dependent hospital programs in their current form. Um, as you know, they are set now to sunset at the end of September. Uh, there is legislation that is running in Congress that would extend it through the next fiscal year. Hopefully we will see that, but obviously it is a very unstable basis for making financial decisions when you're literally considering year to year, do we have enough funding? So I think does that have an impact on the number of IPPS that are going to consider moving to REH? And we'll see that uh, pretty soon. Compared to that 68 number though, we've actually had 27 organizations that have converted to REH as of May 1st. Again, I checked the website right before we started. No one has snuck in since. Uh, that includes 12 critical access hospitals and 14 PPS hospitals. Uh, we've already had one organization that converted to REH and closed. That was a hospital in Texas. In fact, it was one of the very first converters to REH. There's also an organization, another hospital in Mississippi, that got all through the process of being approved and then someone realized that that hospital was within the MSA for Memphis. And thus the CMS revoked the REH status for that organization. So clearly CMS is going to be serious about the requirements you must meet to become an REH hospital. Um, interestingly, we had another eight rural hospitals close in 2023. Of those, four were not eligible uh, for transition to REH um, status. So that alone tells you we may not have the program um, that really is going to swoop in and help these communities that are about to lose their hospital. Um, another impact on this conversion um, is the, nest, the requirement that the state in which you are located has to have legislation that recognizes REH as a provider type. Um, and according to the National Conference of State Legislatures, uh, there are 17 states that have in fact enacted REH authorizing legislation. As you see, it's probably the states where, where we have had conversions to this point in time. Florida authorized uh, this year. They did, that's right. I saw that. It's effective on July 1st. So maybe yeah. there are hospitals waiting. Um, that's an interesting point though, because having talked now to a couple of organizations that have gone through this process, it moves fast. Um, that once you make notification to the regional office that you are interested in making this transition, it is around three weeks, soup to nuts. Um, and part of that, of course, is assurances that you're not going to have cash flow issues uh, because obviously you have to give up your inpatient beds and your inpatient ability to bill for inpatient services. But you need that $3.4 million the, the segment of it, the, the monthly payment coming in the door as well. Again, reports are that those payments immediately started. Um, so it appears that there is a commitment at the uh, at CMS level uh, to ensure this program is operating well. Um, in terms of the REH implementing regulations, it was in the 2023 OPPS final rule that we created the REH conditions of participation, which are sort of a crazy cross between the hospital cops and the call cops, which I can't explain. Uh, but then shortly thereafter, in January of 2024, not 2034, 2024, I apologize, um, CMS published guidance on the enrollment and conversion process. Uh, the, this year's OPPS final rule established the REH quality reporting program. It's sort of a, a program without a bite because whether you report or not, or the score on your measures doesn't impact your payment. It's really for 
public notification purposes that these uh, measures are scored. And in fact, as you see, three of the four measures are claims based. There's only one on which is a chart abstracted, and that's medium time from arrival to dis from arrival to discharge. Um, so that is an interesting, you know, where are we going to go with this measure going forward? Um, of course, we're waiting on the 2025 OPPS proposed rule, probably going to be published, at least Kathy and I hope so, uh, the second week in July, third week in July. Um, we know and fully expect that the respiratory illness reporting COP that we talked about previously for hospitals and critical access hospitals, we expect to see one for REHs that included in that, and we'll just see what else CMS intends to do. I mean, part of our problem is a lot of challenges in this program are statutory. Um, and that includes this program isn't available if your hospital closed prior to actually December 20th of 2020, December 27th of 2020. I just round that up to 2021. Um, so a lot of communities that lost their hospital um, who think this would be a perfect program for them don't have a vehicle. Again, had pending legislation in Congress that would reach back to 2014. So at least provide relief there. Um, loss of swing beds. Uh, instead, if you intend to provide that post-acute level of care, that you would have to create a SNF distinct part unit, meaning you have to meet the SNF conditions of participation, as well as the requirements for SNF billing, which are really the challenge there. Um, so that's for organizations that have a pretty healthy swing bed program, that's really been their sort of choke point on moving forward with REH. Then finally, as I referenced previously, um, REH uh, are not identified covered entities and so cannot be 340B participants. Um, again, that has been another point where hospitals have just said this isn't going to work. Um, again, legislation has been introduced in Congress. It seems Congress has really done a good job, at least this year, of hearing rural hospital concerns um, and beginning to address that through legislation. Uh, there are some reimbursement issues still out there, including what's Medicare Advantage going to do with uh, REHs? Um, both in terms of in-network and out-of-network services. You know, generally for out-of-network services that are provided by an out-of-network, for emergency services provided by an out-of-network provider, the obligation on the MA plan is to make payment equivalent to the traditional Medicare reimbursement. Is that simply OPPS plus 5%? Absolutely no. not, because you're getting a $3.4 million payment to keep you operational. And so how are we going to see the calculation of these MA payments uh, for out-of-network services? Similarly, what's gonna be the negotiation on in-network rates for REHs as well? And this becomes critical because REHs are going to be that link in network adequacy for MA plans. So they can't simply work around you. Uh, they're going to have to include you within the network, their network adequacy. Um, similar, We've got to figure out what state Medicaid plans are going to do. Most Medicaid plans kind of follow the rules for critical access hospitals. Um, and our state Medicaid program is going to do something similar with respect to REHs, especially in those rural areas with a higher Medicaid population. And right along that is what our commercial payer is going to do. We're just kind of starting to see the answers to these questions. We've got converters that are just over a year now. Um, and they are grappling with these issues as well. Uh, finally, there's some practical issues we've got to grapple with with the REH program. Um, one is the observation bed capacity. If you're no longer going to accept inpatient admissions, how many folks can you keep local in an observation bed and be paid for those under OPPS? You have to navigate the 24-hour average rule. An REH has to maintain an average of 24-hour um, treatment. So from the time the person walks in to the time they're discharged, on average, that can't exceed 24, hour, 24 hours in a year. For the year period, it can't be above 24 hours. You know what I mean, right? As I said, I can't add. I can't talk numbers in any way. But there's really a question here is as you're thinking about staffing, as you're thinking about reallocation of resources, how much of that inpatient capacity you had can you actually maintain and better serve the community by doing so? When you have those folks that have low case mix index admissions, um, could you manage that patient? Um, even though they may qualify for inpatient, do they have to be in an inpatient bed? Can you manage them locally? 
There are, of course, the transportation issues to and from an inpatient facility when that's necessary. And then particularly for the PPS hospitals, um, it's the consideration of really what can we, how much juice can we squeeze out of the orange, right, in terms of expense reduction. Because for critical access hospital, what we're seeing at least is that these are hospitals that tend to have inpatient volume, inpatient revenue for all payers below the amount of that annual payment. That's pretty straightforward math. Even I can do that. But when you get to a PPS hospital that has maybe a higher um, inpatient revenue uh, in excess of that 3.4 million, you're betting that you can reduce expenses um, to make this work. And it's really where is the expense reduction available? How are you going to staff moving forward? These are sort of the practical issues that we're going to start seeing address again now as we have some practical experience around the program. An impact on the community if you are laying off staff. Oh, yeah. Um, so let's, that takes us, uh, Trevor, to polling question number three, please. Our next polling question is, what would be the greatest improvement to the Rural Emergency Hospital Program? Permit 340B participation? Make all previously closed rural hospitals eligible? Continue swing bed reimbursement? Require Medicare Advantage plans to pay enhanced reimbursement? Or unsure? Remember, you must fill out the polling questions in order to receive CPE credit. Thank you for participating in our poll. Now I'll hand it back over to our presenters. Many problems requiring many solutions, it looks like. It's very interesting across the board. Okay. It just gives me fits when we come up polling questions. Sorry about that. Let's talk telehealth um, and what, how much of an influx things are these days. Um, go back to March of 2020. Uh, we operated under a statutory scheme, Section 1834M of the Social Security Act, which limited Medicare coverage for telehealth services. Uh, specifically that you have to be located in a rural area, you have to be present at a specific facility, it has to be an audiovisual connection, it has to be a service that's specified on the telehealth list. And not surprisingly, with those level of restrictions, we had very little telehealth utilization um, prior to the pandemic. And then March 18th, I will always remember the date, um, CMS came out and said, yeah, no, uh, we got a pandemic on our hands. We're going to weigh those requirements because we know people need to receive services and telehealth we know is a safe and practical way to accomplish that. And so they waived most of those 1834M restrictions. At the end of the PHE, um, at that point, CMS's authority to waive those requirements evaporated. Congress, however, stepped in and has extended those waivers and the current authorization that comes out of the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2023 extends those flexibilities through the end of this year. Um, that includes, of course, importantly, the waiver of the geographic and location requirements. So I, living in an urban area at my home, in my office, can receive telehealth services, and that's reimbursable if I was a Medicare beneficiary. But close, almost there. Um, but, you know, that's certainly been the most expansive part of the telehealth rules. Um, we've delayed the in-person requirement for expanded telebehavioral health services as part of Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2020. Congress permanently removed those restrictions with respect to behavioral health services and said that those can be provided without regard to the 1834M restrictions. However, we require a one-time face-to-face before initiating telehealth services, but that required face-to-face -face has been waived through the end of this year. Um, we've added marriage and family therapists and mental health counselors as telehealth practitioners. Uh, continuation of audio only services um, and providing other services uh, specified there on the slide being furnished by institutional staff in a hospital. And finally, important and importantly, we continued FQHC and RHC reimbursement for medical telehealth services through the end of the year. We'll come back and talk about behavioral health telehealth services in a few minutes. Um, currently, we have a continuation of virtual supervision for purposes of incident to billing, that will also continue through 2024. Uh, and importantly this year, CMS revisited this issue of the telehealth services list and uh, made policy changes at a permanent level. We used to have uh, the list of telehealth service, which before the pandemic, there was about 100. Um, through the pandemic, we 
right, ratcheted it up to about 250 services that could be delivered via telehealth. They used to be categorized one, two, and three, depending on the level of evidence supporting them. CMS said that's way too confusing. We're going to go to just two categories, permanent and provisional. Provisional does not mean temporary. Provisional simply means that the evidence base is still developing and there is no negative indication uh, regarding the use of telehealth for the service. So all of the services that we had expanded out to during the PHE up to that 250 number, all of those will remain telehealth services regardless of what happens in Congress in, in, for 2024 and beyond um, because we will keep all of those services unless, of course, there's some evidence that shows that it is a negative implication. So what's the issue here? It's all about Congress. Yes, there's legislation that has been running that would extend these coverages through, I think the current bill, Kathy, is two years, right, through 2026. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the question is, are we just going to continue doing this piece by piece by piece, um, or are we eventually going to get to some sort of permanent solution regarding uh, Medicare telehealth coverage? Um, other changes that CMS have made to pay attention to in the telehealth space um, is the place of service to be listed on telehealth codes. So beginning in January of this year, we discontinued use of 95 modifier plus place of service where services would have been delivered face to face and now just use POS2, which is provided in a location other than the patient's home and POS10 located in the patient is located at home. Okay. Um, the difference is of course, POS is money. POS 10 patient home is going to be reimbursed at the higher non-facility rate. POS2, however, will be paid at the lower facility rate. So even if you're an independent physician practice billing for telehealth, you have to list O2 if the patient's not at home, you're going to be paid at the lower facility rate for those services. The idea CMS has is that it's cheaper to your practice to deliver telehealth than face-to-face -face purposes. Um, we continued the, the spending of the frequency limits uh, for telehealth services with regard to subsequent inpatient visits, nursing visits, and then critical care consultations. This will continue to the end of this year. Uh, continue to permit teaching physicians to use virtual presence again through the end of this year. Um, continue to permit opioid treatment programs to furnish periodic assessments via telehealth audio only through the end of this year. Um, one permanent change made was to eliminate the in-person requirement for injection training uh, for diabetes self-management training programs. Um, so that's where we are. Um, everything's where it kind of was, except the permanence now of the telehealth list. It is really up to Congress to decide what the action is going to be. That, of course, gets us to polling question number four. Our next polling question is, do you believe Congress will permanently expand Medicare telehealth coverage? Yes. No, it will continue with short-term fixes. No, it will discontinue expanded coverage or unsure. Remember, you must fill out the polling questions in order to receive CPE credit. Thank you for participating in our poll. Now I'll hand it back over to our presenters. I like the optimists again here, um, but the 6% of you um, don't trust the folks in Washington, apparently. It's a really interesting issue um, because there's a, it's a pay-for issue. It all comes down to if we're going to expand telehealth coverage, how are we going to pay for it? And the Con Congressional Budget Office has always taken this approach that it's a new benefit. So it's going to add costs in the Medicare program, so it has to be offset. Um, but I think the study is now, the studies and the research that's coming out of the pandemic are now saying, yeah, no, it's substitute. Yeah, it's a replacement for face-to-face -face visits. And so hopefully as that research keeps developing and, and, uh, and the Congressional Budget Office starts reading those studies that the fiscal note attached to a permanent fix will now become manageable. Um, but my best guess, Kathy, is they're going to go for two more years in this round of legislation. What's I, your I actually wish you had rephrased the question, do you believe Congress will permanently expand Medicare telehealth coverage in your lifetime? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe that is the best approach. So <laughs> um, let's talk, if I can get the slide to move, which is always the problem, right? Um, let's talk rural health clinics and what's new on your fronts. And um, Marty, we've got about 15 minutes. Awesome. Okay. I used to want to talk about Medicare Advantage. So you're telling me. No, I, I, I I, everybody's worst issue. 
Exactly, exactly. Uh, of course, the big news is this movement towards the national standardized air for all independent RHCs, as well as any provider-based RHC created um, after December 27, 2020. Um, we're about halfway there in ramping up the air. Um, so we're now at $139, we're eventually gonna get to 190. Um, so about doubling what the standard air was. What this means is we certainly have folks now interested in opening rural health clinics uh, because an independent RHC used to be just a money loser. Uh, the air was less than most fee schedule rates. And so there wasn't that incentive there, but we know we're having more conversations with folks about the RHC conversion, um, which hopefully will bring new providers um, into our communities. I referenced previously telehealth um, and the, the change made for behavioral health services. Uh, this was the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2021. So this is the third CAA I've mentioned. Uh, but this one said that telebehavioral health services furnished through an RHC qualify as an RHC visit. So you know for medical telehealth services, you get paid that average rate, which is like $93. Um, for regardless of the type of service. But if you are providing a behavioral health service, it's treated the exact same as if it was a face-to-face -face visit. You have to use an audio-visual connection, except if you determine that the patient does not want to or cannot have a visual connection, it could be audio only, and there's a code for that. You include a modifier on the bill. Um, and then for now, effective January 1st of 2025, there has to be an in-person mental health service that's furnished within six months of furnishing the services on a tele on an ongoing telehealth basis. This is, of course, this has been delayed because we're right now in this period of extended flexibilities um, on the requirements. And hopefully this will be permanent because this sort of defeats the purpose, shall we say, um, that if, if you want to provide these services telehealth, creating this in-person first requirement has become an obstacle to really expanding out these services. Um, if you are billing for the service, it goes under Revenue Code 0900 uh, with the appropriate HICSPIX code, and of course include modifier GC, indicating that's the primary reason for the visit so that it will be then paid at your full air. For medical services, as, re as referenced previously, uh, we're going to continue to provide under G2025 through the end of this year. A payment rate's a little higher, it's $95. Um, and it has to be one of those approved telehealth services um, that you provide through an RHC practitioner via telehealth. And again, we still have the good old originating site fee, G3014. So if you are where the patient is physically present, when a distant site provider is furnishing telehealth, you get paid under Q3014, it's about now $30. $30. This is the only item on the Medicare Physician Fee Schedule that is inflation adjusted. That's just another story, a whole another webinar um, on that issue. <laughs> Finally, RHC Care soapbox, Management Services. Marty. I'm sorry. I said actually it's a soapbox for you. It, if you it is my official soapbox. It's an inflation it factor. <laughs> exactly. Um, good old G0511, which is the code under which RHCs and FQHCs bill for care management services. That list expanded significantly for 2024, uh, bringing in those new services that CMS now reimburses on the fee schedule for uh, services related to social determinants of health. That was last week's webinar, uh, but that's CHI and PIN. Uh, those are now reimbursable along with the remote therapeutic and remote physiologic services. Those are now reimbursable under GO511. Uh, the rate for GO511, the manner which is calculated was changed. The rate didn't change that much. It sits at about $74. Um, it is not inflation adjusted. Sorry, can't resist. Um, that's billed under revenue code 05211. The last bullet is the most important point here, which is CMS clarified that a RHC can bill for more than one unit of GO511 each year. Why I put quotes around clarification is because they issued guidance in December of 2019 that plainly said one unit of GO511 a month only. Now they've come back and in official rulemaking reversed that and said, yes, you can build multiple units provided you're meeting the requirements um, and the resource costs aren't counted more than once. So if you're providing remote patient monitoring and chronic care management and 
chronic pain management, for example, if you meet the requirements and you've delivered the service, you can bill multiple units of GO511. What we don't know is the add-on codes. So for example, for chronic care management, you know, 99490 is 20 minutes of chronic care management services. 99439 is an additional 20 minutes. The question is, if I provide 40 minutes of CCM and an RHC, can I build two units of GO511? The guidance is at best murky on this. I think at right now I interpret it as saying, no, you can't. But boy, if I got my fingers crossed that this is addressed in the 2025 fee schedule, if it isn't in the proposed rule, it is certainly an area on which to comment because that will make a big difference in making these RHC-based care management programs work. Long-term care facilities, very briefly, because I'm sure you have read plenty of this lately, um, but the long, the long the everyone's calling this the minimum standards bill, a minimum standards rule that was published in April, but there's two components to this rule, and I don't want you to lose sight of the enhanced facility assessment requirements. So for long-term care facilities today, they are required to conduct and then review annually sort of a facility-wide assessment. What resources do we have that meet the needs of our particular patients, both for regular operations as well as emergencies? There are now enhancements to that assessment requirement that are effective August 8th of this year. And it includes the use of evidence-based methods when you're doing care planning for residents, um, especially focusing on their behavioral health needs and resources necessary to meet those. Um, using your facility assessment to assess each patient's specific needs and adjust as necessary as you have changes in your resident population then including uh, input from different organizations, from the governing board, the medical director, as well as residents and family members. Um, and then so that your, your assessment's really matching the needs of those who are all stakeholders. And finally, then having a formal staffing plan that maximizes staff recruitment and retention. Why are we maximizing staff recruitment and retention? It is the new minimum staffing requirements. The good news is take a deep breath. Uh, Martin, because before this, you go on, can you clarify for the listeners, yep. how are we defining a long-term care facility? A, not, a, a non-SNF. Okay. Right? Okay. Just wanted yep. to make sure. It's not assisted living. It's not independent right. living, right? right. It's a, it is a residential long-term care with nursing services as, a, as an LTC. Um, and it's defined differently in different states, but that's generally the definition. Thank you. Um, take a deep breath. None of these requirements will be applicable to rural facilities any earlier the 2027. Um, as you probably are well aware, there's a whole bunch of litigation now brewing and actually on, on the front burner. Um, and so we'll see where this rule ends up. Uh, but you can see here on the screen what requirements are being proposed. Well, not they've been finalized, but will now be litigated. Um, and how CMS has uh, created a an exception here, not an exception, but a different treatment for urban facilities versus rural facilities. So some appreciation um, that it is certainly going to be harder to implement this with available resources in rural communities. The real, it's that 0 0.55 hours per resident stay from RNs, that is the issue. Um, about, you kind of get differing reports, but there's something around 70% of LTCs can do not presently meet that requirement. There's a much higher percentage that meet the overall 3.48 requirement, but the 0.55 requirement is much more controversial. Um, but that is something we're looking at five years in the future uh, for our rural facilities. You can note the hardship exemption. It's really not easy to get there, um, but it's basically you have a shortage, you have a, a, a workforce pool that is limited and you have a plan to work forward to bring staff in. So it's not just, hey, we're rural, we don't have to meet the rules. Um, it is a very structured hardship exemption. So don't think forward that that's gonna be what you can rely on. This may be an invitation for you to get engaged in the process if you see this as potentially threatening um, your long-term care business. Kathy, here it is, number 10, all for you, Medicare right. Advantage. Well, we're gonna share this one a little bit, but let's go ahead on to the next slide and start looking at Medicare, um, a Medicare Advantage, the penetration. And what we're seeing is that in rural areas, it's growing rapidly. I mean, significant penetration in, in the markets. Um, and if you don't, it'd be interesting actually to see this in terms of highlighting certain areas within a state. 
um, in terms of the penetration as well. But recognize that we do have continued growth in Medicare Advantage right now. 51, 52% of all Medicare enrollees are in a managed care plan. And as we have those patients in managed care, we are having to address payment. We're having to address the administrative burden associated with those plans uh, as well. But why do the plans on the next slide, what, what is this thing in terms of Medicare Advantage and why are they so focused on growing? Um, look at the margins per enrollee. Um, you can see over from 2018 to 2021, significant margins on the part of Medicare Advantage plans per enrollee, um, and they continue to go up. There was a little bump in um, 2020 that went, uh, there was a big bump in 2020 that has started to go down a little bit in 21. I think we're going to see it go back up again significantly um, as we move forward. Next slide. Uh, Marty used this term of the MA plans are a three-headed monster. I think many of the providers out there, whether you're a rural provider or an urban area, agree. Um, we got to focus on the issue of payment rates, uh, prior authorizations and denials, and then the issue of beneficiary, beneficiary recruitment and beneficiaries not really being able to leave an MA plan. Next slide. Um, one of the issues that has been raised, the Medicare um, Ad, Medicare Payment Advisory Commission is focusing um, this year, this new year, um, um, on rural hospitals. And they have begun doing some significant analysis. And one of the issues that they're raising is um, there are a number of add-on payments that are made to rural hospitals under fee-for-service Medicare. And the question is, are you getting this um, from a Medicare Advantage plan? So you've got your sole community hospitals, your Medicare dependent hospitals, your LVH hospitals that get a higher inpatient prospective payment system rate. You've got the critical access hospital cost reimbursement that has retro adjust adjustments. Are those being made by the plans? You've got the issue of, gee, 340B and whether or not the plans are making you whole as they as fee-for-service Medicare is because of the underpayments for the last couple of years. Um, then, then the even for the rural emergency hospitals, I think Marty mentioned already, um, how are the plans paying you that fixed payment amount? How can they calculate that? So do the plans provide these additional payments to the hospitals? On the same side, uh, if you turn to the physician perspective, there are a number of different add-ons there. Um, are these being addressed in managed care contracting? Are these being paid? Are you being able to receive the same level of reimbursement for these Medicare Advantage enrollees as you were getting under fee-for-service Medicare? Uh, MedPAC in their analysis essentially is looking at um, the margins, the Medicare margins versus all payer margins. And you can see that for the, um, uh, let's say the rural um, IPPS hospitals, the significant difference between their Medicare margins and their all payer margins, they are suffering under the Medicare side. Marty? Um, from a operations perspective, and I think this is the other big headache that we are getting, um, the American Hospital Association and Centillus published this trend report that looks at, first of all, Medicare Advantage and commercials den commercial denials, they're increasing, but look at how much MA denials are increasing um, from January of 22 to July of 22. Huge increase. Go back a minute. Go oh. Too quick. That that was on the um, 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 the the denials um, are well. I guess we're okay. I know we're in the interest of time. So sorry, sorry. Um, there was a rule that I think this is a first step in making things better for hospitals in terms of coverage and utilization guidelines for Medicare Advantage. Basically, saying that the MA plans are going to have to follow traditional Medicare rules as it relates to coverage and utilization. If it is something that has been issued by CMS 
for fee for service beneficiaries, the plans have to follow it. They are going to have to follow the national coverage determinations, the local determinations, um, uh, the, uh, the various criteria for coverage of a particular service. Um, two major issues here that are included, first of all, um, if a service is on the inpatient only list um, for um, Medicare reimbursement for fee for service, the plans have to pay you as an inpatient. Um, they cannot say this could have been done on an outpatient basis. It is on the Medicare inpatient only list. And then secondly, on the issue of two midnight stays, if a patient has a physician documented expectation of two midnights, the care has to be covered as an inpatient by the Medicare Advantage program. Physician documentation of ex expectation and the reason behind that expectation, it must be covered if the, if, whether the patient stays to midnights or not. They do not have to follow the two midnight presumption that essentially says once a patient stays to midnights, they must have been okay as an inpatient. That is not something that they have to follow. Um, there must be, uh, if the plans are not allowed to use um, um, proprietary criteria for determining coverage, if there isn't anything by fee-for-service Medicare, they're going to have to define the, when services are appropriate. They're going to have to use publicly um, available evidence um, developed by the various uh, clinical specialties. It's going to have to be available to you. It's going to be posted on their website. You can see it. The patient can see it. Your physician can see it. Um, they also are going to have to have a utilization management committee that is, believe it or not, actually led by a medical director. Um, and one of the issues that um, I think is significant for those enrollees who perhaps move from one plan to the other is that if they, they have a prior authorization, um, that is going to have to continue to be valid um, if a patient moves uh, from pl plan A to plan B for at least 90 days. All of these were effective January 1. CMS did publish an FAQ that was to the plans, not to providers, that basically says this is what we mean by coverage and utilization criteria, very explicit. Um, if you do not have a copy of this regulation or this FAQ, um, we've given you the link on the bottom. I would make sure you keep it, maintain it, have it handy. Um, we already talked about the benchmark versus the presumption. So the other big issue that we're dealing with is that of prior authorization. Um, we do have um, a requirement, although it's not in effect until January of 2026, that the plans are required to send prior authorization deci decisions within 72 hours for urgent requests and seven calendar days for standard requests. CMS has answered that. The, it is the um, requesting physician or provider who makes the determination whether or not the request is urgent or uh, a standard request. Um, they are also going to be required to provide a written explanation for their decision. Um, Oops. We, that's okay. I think in the interest of time. Um, okay. okay. At, at the Healthcare, Finan Healthcare Financial Management Association, HFMA, has done um, a query of um, the CFOs uh, for their biggest pain points for this year. And you can see um, that Medicare Advantage is um, a major issue. Um, and so they ask, are you planning to uh, perhaps stop accepting Medicare Advantage? And a large number of the um, providers have said that they are definitely looking at it. Um, so it is a concern in terms of um, moving forward. But we have to face the issue of the impact on the beneficiary. If a provider goes out of network, um, the, the patient has the opportunity to enroll with another plan, find another provider. But you really have the issue, the concern for the Medicare beneficiary when it comes to the availability of or the availability is there, but the cost associated with getting a Medigap plan. Because if I have enrolled into Medicare managed care and now I want to drop out, I'm going to have to have my um, 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 the medical underwriting of my, um, my Medigap plan. 
that means that if I've had any treatments, any illnesses that perhaps would be costly, my premiums are going to be higher. There is a legislation addressed that could perhaps address this to eliminate the medical underwriting. We do have four states that have done it, but we do need to move forward with it. So last question. Our last point question is, has Medicare Advantage negatively impacted your organization in the last two years? Little to no impact, some impact but manageable, significant impact, Congress needs to act, unsure, or my organization is not a healthcare provider. Remember, you must fill out the polling questions in order to receive CPE credit. Thank you for participating in our poll. Now I'll hand it back over to our presenters. Not surprising there um, on that. And I think we're going to close here on, on this result. Um, which is not surprising that this has really become a very significant issue for rural providers. Um, and you'll have the power, the PowerPoint um, will be, it's included in the pane on, on here on the, on the screen, but we'll also receive a copy of the PowerPoint as well as the recording for this webinar by, via email. Um, so we'll, the few slides we weren't able to get to, hopefully you'll have an opportunity to review them. Kathy, I hope this has been helpful, sort of doing this from a rural bent. Um, again, as we said, if you have comments, questions, new topics we should cover, we'd really appreciate it. So Trevor, back to you. Thank you for listening to this PYA webinar recast. The video recording, slides, and associated material for this and all PYA webinars are available on our website. If you have any questions or if we can help, please contact us at PYAPC.com. Thank you again for joining us and have a great rest of your day.